Would you please read with me this slide and this verse from Psalm 139? You have searched me out and know me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. Psalm 139, 1 and 2. Isn't it amazing that God knows what you're thinking right now? And what I'm thinking right now. Oh, yeah, the smiles are coming out. What are you thinking about? Amazing, isn't it? The weight of your life this week, if it was tough, he knew it. The goodness that you experienced, like at prom last night, he knows it. He knows what you struggle with. He knows your joy. He knows your attitude. He knows if you're thinking about lunch right now. He knows. I know too, because I see you looking at your watch. God is amazing. He is all-knowing. He's all-powerful. And He is concerned about what goes on in here. In here and in here. He's concerned about that. And that's what we've been talking about these last 13 weeks throughout the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is concerned about what goes on in here and in here. And today, in this final ending to His sermon, there's going to be a challenge and a warning. And He wants us to hear it. Let's pray. Father, thank You for all who have gathered this day. You have brought us here for a reason. You knew that we would be sitting in the places that we're sitting right now, and You know that this Word that has traveled across time is to bless us, encourage us, and draw us closer to Your heart. So, Holy Spirit, do Your work among us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please get out the Bibles that are in front of you and turn to Matthew 7. We'll be starting in verse 13. I'm going to be reading a lot of Scripture today, so if you could please follow along. And I just encourage you to leave your Bibles out as well as we go through the message today. Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, and the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their other teachers of the law. Please leave that out. Now, there's three groups of people Jesus is talking to on the Sermon on the Mount. He's talking to his disciples, those who are all in, those who love him, those who are learning from him, those who want to be like Jesus, 
There are those who are just there to observe. They're like, who is this Jesus? We've heard a few things about him. What is he teaching? And then there's the Pharisees. Those are the ones, the teachers of the law, the pastors of the day. And they're wondering, who is this? Is he threatening us with his words? And Jesus, the master teacher, knowing that there are all a variety of thoughts and feelings going on in this moment when this sermon is being preached, he uses illustrations. The master teacher. And he does this to bring clarity to those who are in attendance and those who desire to follow him and have life in the kingdom. So look with me to verse 13 and 14. He uses the image of a narrow gate here that leads to life, this path, this road that leads to life. What is Jesus saying here? He's saying to live life in the kingdom, we must be focused. Look at here, we've got a kind of a narrow way here, right? If I walk this way, if I walk this direction, hey, good morning. Hey, how are you? Good to see you. Welcome to church. If I walk this narrow way, I stay on the path, I do the things God wants me to do, I love him, I love others, I love those who don't even like me. But you know what? I can get easily off the path. Oh, money. Hey, money is really nice. I'm going to put my trust in that. Well, I'll get back on the path again. Focus on what's important. Oh, pleasure. I love pleasure. I'm going to go this way. Hi, family. Oh, I better get back on the path. Jesus is describing for them in this narrow path, the narrow gate is that we can live a life that is distracted. And he's saying, don't get distracted. Stay on the narrow path. That's where real life is. How many of us get distracted during our week? Don't raise your hands. <laughs> Kidding. We all do. Jesus is saying in all of this sermon that he has said to us throughout the Sermon on the Mount, these last 13 weeks have been going through, he says, stay on the path. That's where life is. Loving me is where life is. Doing all the things that he said earlier, that's where life is. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life. And only a few will find it. We are not to live distracted lives, but to focus on this kingdom in which he has established and is establishing now in our hearts and our minds. Look with me in verse 16 through 20. He talks about fruit, good fruit, a great illustration, good fruit and bad fruit, describing the types of prophets and teachers and how they would distinguish between those who are true prophets and true teachers and those who are not. You see, good fruit nourishes us. Fruit grows when it's healthy. When the plant is connected to the vine, it produces fruit. There's a whole verse, chapter in John 15 about remaining close to the vine, remaining close to Jesus, his teachings, his love for us. You see, healthy people produce good fruit. And that fruit can be described as peace and patience and kindness. Good fruit is the fruits of the Spirit that we see in Galatians. We see love in in 1 Corinthians, the description of what love is, patient and kind, truthful. Healthy things grow, and Jesus is talking here about being healthy in the way in which we think about God and in our hearts. And we need to be careful about other teachers leading us away from the truth of Jesus and the authority of his word. Friends, we are in a battle in our world today. The word of God is our authority for life, to live the real life, the life in which God intended us to when he gave us breath in our lungs. And as our world continues to increase its focus on self, We are inundated with different perspectives and philosophies and false teachings that take us away from the right path. We are to be discerning. We are to be wise. We are to look to Jesus and His words. He is the author of the authority of life. 
after Jesus describes what living in the kingdom is like, living a life focused on him, we then come to the one of the most troubling statements by Jesus, one of the most troubling statements in Scripture. In Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, evildoers. Now, if you're engaged with me right now, this is a troubling statement. If you're engaged right now in this moment with the Spirit of God with us, this is a troubling statement because it cuts to the heart of who we are. Friends, do we appear religious or do we love Jesus? I mean, think about the things that Jesus describes here in the text. You would think they're believers, right? I mean, they perform miracles. They drove out demons. And Jesus says, I never knew you. What is he saying here? Scholar R.T. Kendall states this. He says, folk religion, F-O-L-K, folk religion, is a little bit of religion that makes us feel comfortable and spiritual. But it does not change our lives or show us how to die. It keeps us in our comfort zones. Every generation has its own brand of this type of religion. The main ingredients are smugness, self-satisfaction, and superiority. It's whatever helps us avoid pain or inconvenience in the here and now. It's having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Teaching may sometimes be fairly sound, but it doesn't disturb us enough in our lifestyle. You know, we see in other scripture texts, Jesus is so hard on those that are part of the religious establishment that focus on the outward appearance instead of an inward transformation. Yes, we are to be salt and light. We are to be active for Christ in the world in our words and our deeds. But we are to constantly challenge our perspective and actions in the world as we move from a self-focus to an outward focus because our foundation is in Jesus. Friends, what is Jesus asking you to change in your life today? What is he asking me to change in my life today? Is he asking me to change how I think or act? What sin are we battling with in our lives that we might be losing to it? And he's saying, trust me. You see, Jesus desires followers that follow him with their hearts. They desire what he desires. Not a bunch of religious rule followers that judge other people. He wants to see real fruit in our lives. And another question that stems from this one is, who's saved? Who is saved to eternal life? Can we be assured of our salvation? For those that approach Jesus and call him Lord, they did many good things in his name if we look at this seriously, it gets a little confusing. Scholar Burke Parsons states this. He says, it's a significant question, and it's not as simple as we would want to make it because we have to deal not only with the lacking assurance that people may feel of salvation and eternal life, but also a false assurance that people may have with eternal life. We could say that both are problems, but I'd actually suggest that false assurance of salvation is, in some ways, a bigger problem. Parsons goes on to say, there are people who think they are Christians, and they're actually not. They go through a lot of the motions, and they do the rest of things that they're supposed to do, but they're not resting in Jesus and His work for them. Parsons goes on to say, that's the warning that we hear in Matthew 7. There will be many who come to Him that day, He says, but I will never know you. 
But if we look at the text in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, he says their focus was on what they were doing for Christ, not on what Christ did for them. Jesus says, away from you because you're focusing on what you do for me and not what he has done for us. You see, that's the real center point of assurance, Parson says. Are we looking to Christ? If we're looking to our own works, we will always be disappointed. If we are looking to our own hearts, we will always be sad and fall into despair. But if we are looking to the cross, if we're looking to what Jesus has done for us, we can have assurance of eternal life. We look to the objective reality that He didn't just come to make salvation possible or to offer salvation. He actually became sin for us. And He died for us that we could live. Oh, friends. So the question is, friends, do we really believe in Christ or are we trying to work out our own life and look religious to people? Do you believe in Christ? And if you believe in Him, you can know that you have eternal life. Right now, you can know that you have eternal life. Parsons goes on to say there's been a great deal of confusion in many churches about this. We want to add something to it. But of course, friends, the reality is is that if we have a real faith, if we really believe, fruit will be produced. If there's no fruit, then there's no real faith. But if there's real faith, there's real repentance, and there's real fruit in our lives. So then Jesus, the master teacher, goes back, right? And he shows another illustration. And here it is, the house on the rock. What's he saying here? He's saying, everything's dependent on me. Put your house on the foundation of me. Isn't that beautiful how he starts out this passage with the illustrations? Then he goes to this really difficult, challenging passage, and then he reiterates again by saying, rest in me. Rest in me. Jesus addresses these varieties of people. He addresses us today with the illustrations in the sermon to make it clear. In doing so, he reminds us that there's no middle ground when it comes to faith in Christ. People either will or will not respond to him in faith. And for those who respond, the words lead to life, to fruit, a sturdy foundation that when we have difficulties in this life, we can remain free in him despite the pain we endure. These words by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount challenge them and they challenge us today to examine our inner life with God. Do we trust Him? Are we obedient to Him? Are we dying to our selfish desires every day? Are we battling our sin? You know, I met with a friend this week and I was sharing a confession time and I was kind of sharing my sin. So this is what I struggle with. And after I shared it, he looked at me, he goes, oh, so you still need Jesus. Yes, I still need Jesus. Do you? That was a great word. It was a great reminder to me. We always need Jesus, and we convince ourselves or are prideful enough to think that we don't. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life and only a few find it. True life, not distracted life, not an angry life, not a life that's dependent upon our own good works, but a life that bears fruit for Christ. You see, friends, we experience the more the peace of God's salvation in us as we dwell with Him, His shalom, His peace that surrounds us. When I go subbing on Tuesdays, I pray, God, let me be an instrument of peace. There's so much chaos in the world. We all bring peace when we dwell with God. 
The other day I visited someone in the hospital and you know, they still have the protocol there. When you go in to see someone, you gotta put on a mask, right? We'll see how this works with my mic. So you, you do the right thing, right? You put on your mask, you get your temperature, you get your, your uh, little sticker that says you're okay to go in, and then you go in and you see the individual. And what was interesting is as I was going up to see that person, I looked and I thought I saw somebody that I knew, but I wasn't sure because I couldn't. They had a mask on too and I couldn't see them very well. And I got to think, how many of us are walking around with this on? Now, not, not the physical mask, but a mask of pretending to be somebody we're not. People are hard to really know when you can't see them, right? Are you allowing people to really know who you are? Am I? Students, who are you trying to be at school? Adults, who are you trying to be at home or at work? Are we trying to impress other people? Or are we just abiding in the vine, walking down the path? Barren fruit. A pastor, teacher, a scholar of this study in Matthew 7 also wrote, he said, in summary, we are not saved by but two good works. It's not about what we do for Jesus, but it's what Jesus has done for us, and we can't help but bear fruit doing that. I share this story to encourage you, okay? Um, yesterday I was at Subway, and... I saw two college students there, and one real simple way to bless people is to buy their food. People like food. They do. And so I let a lady go in front of me. I said, hey, guys, are you from the college? Well, they had William Penn stuff all over them, so. <laughs> yeah. I said, lunch is on me. What? Yeah, lunch is on me. I said, get what you want. And they got footlongs. <laughs> and, I, and so we go up there, and, and so now I'm thinking I'm in line, right? And I'm like, okay, I gotta say something. I gotta say why I did this. This wasn't just me, because this was Jesus, because I would like to keep that money. And as I left, the one guy stuck his hand out, he said, Thanks. I said, Jesus loves you. And I shook the other guy's hand. I said, Jesus loves you. Now, I don't say that. I, I say that to encourage us to be thinking, to look. You can make a difference and you can proclaim the goodness of Jesus by buying somebody lunch. And I know that people do that in here because I've seen it and I've heard it. Yesterday, people handed out Easter cards at Fairway and Hy-Vee and gave money to people while they gave them the Easter card. What? Generosity, friends. It is the apologetic of our day, as one scholar said. How we are generous to other people is a way in which we will witness for Christ. Some things for us to think about. Do we act more godly than we are? What consumes your thoughts and my thoughts every day? And is Jesus our foundation or are we trying to win his approval? May we live this week in the kingdom. I'd like to finish this series, a great book by Bobby Schuler called Happiness According to Jesus. I just want to read what he had to say. This will tie up this 13 weeks for us. He talked about having a chance wherever we go, a chance for us, a chance for us to be a witness for Christ, to live out these words. He said, this is my chance, going to be at the pharmacy waiting for your medicine, and someone else cuts in line in front of you, that's your chance to be Jesus. It's your chance to love that guy, to encourage him. He's sick and he needs help too. 
you have a dear friend who's in the hospital and you're going to be busy and you're not going to know when to find time. He says, this is your chance. Somebody's going to lash out at you in anger. This is your chance. Always a chance to respond in the way of Jesus. Every day is an opportunity to do what Jesus taught. It's never easy but always fulfilling. Jesus has a way of living. He wants us to be the light of the world. He wants us to relent from our anger. He wants us to put our family first. He wants us to stop lying. He wants us to love our enemies. He wants us to care for those who speak badly about us. He wants to, us to care for the needy, those who are hungry, those who are thirsty. He wants us to care about justice and not to do it for our own glory, but to do it for others. He wants us to be a praying people who pray simply and pray because we know that God is listening. He wants us to be a fasting people. He wants us to be people who stop worrying, who don't think with concern about tomorrow or regret yesterday, but live today in the easy, easy rhythms of grace on the path. He wants us not to store up for ourselves treasures on earth where moths and rust destroy, but to store up real heavenly treasures that we can access today and it never goes away. He wants us to stop judging people, to stop showing religion, stop shoving religion down people's throats. He wants us to know that if we need something, we can simply ask him. Jesus is going to come. He is going to deliver. We know that we serve a good God, and there is a way of living and a way of doing, and we're going to do it. Friends, this week, may we participate in God's kingdom in our hearts and our minds to honor Him. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your goodness. Thank You for Your grace. Thank You for Your Word to us. Though challenging, it draws us closer to the heart of who You are. Thank You for Your truth. Thank You that You are the way, the truth, and the life. So, Father, we love You. We celebrate You in Jesus' name. Amen.